from Berlin in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Now coming up, mutiny inside the world's most valuable startup. Why investors decided it was time for Travis Kalanick to go and the way forward for Uber. Plus, pomp and pageantry take centre stage in Parliament as Queen Elizabeth lays down the laws. How the annual speech to open Parliament this year was dominated by Brexit and a sprinkling of tech. And a new front runner has emerged in the race to buy Toshiba's prized chip business. We'll bring you the details live from Tokyo ahead. But first, to our lead. Travis Kalnick is officially out as Uber CEO, resigning from the company he co-founded. And Bloomberg just reported he will not receive a severance package. Now, while Kalnick's surprise resignation clears the way for a new leader, finding someone of the right caliber who's willing to take on such a difficult job won't be easy. Uber was already struggling in its hunt for number two to fill a chief operating officer role. Now, the company will have to find a new leader, one that will have to please both board members and investors. Now, Kalnick's resignation comes just a week after the board announced he would take a leave of absence following weeks of PR crises, employee exits and a number of scandals. However, the pressure didn't come from the board. Instead, in a rare move, investors pushed for us, him to step aside. After all, these investors have poured more than $15 billion into Uber, a company that is worth over $65 billion. Joining us now from San Francisco is Bloomberg Technologies' Eric Newcomer, who covers Uber for us. And in New York, Nime Meta, partner at Lead Edge, an investor in Uber. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. And Eric, I mean, how expected was this after he took a leave of absence? Uh, it's hard to know what to expect at Uber. I think that uh, Kalanick had hoped that the leave would satisfy his critics and would give him time to sort of recharge after you know, the death of his mother and sort of uh, somewhat sort of take responsibility for uh, the findings of the Holder inquiry. But um, then it clearly wasn't enough. Uh, Bill Gurley and some other major investors in Uber sort of uh, led this campaign to tell Travis that he needed to step aside and that's looks to be what finally convinced him to leave, the com uh, to leave his position as CEO. And Nime, as an investor, this is something you agree with, is it? And why did it come down to the investor base, not the board? I think the investor base uh, represents a large voting interest of the company. And so that's an important um, uh, source of you know, uh, control and influence of the business. Um, I think it's important to recognize that Travis Kalanick also resigned, sort of prompted by this, but he's made the determination that this is actually the right thing for the company. He didn't have to resign. And so let's not discount you know, the role of Travis in making that decision for himself. And, and yes, prompted by the investors, but, but uh, he absolutely had a hand in it as well. Eric, can you explain to us potentially why the board hadn't taken such action prior to this? I mean, were their hands tied? Was it to do with Travis's own voting share? Well, Travis has a lot of control over the company, uh, especially when coupled with Garrett Camp, his co-founder, and Ryan Graves, an early employee and uh, early CEO of the company. So together, they had a pretty strong coalition there. And then, I mean, I think there was a lot of faith in Travis. I mean, this is, he's been a key man in defining the company for good and bad. You know, Uber did 20 billion in gross bookings last year. I mean, amid all the scandals, it's easy to forget how enormous this business is, how global it is. So it will be a question how somebody else can step in and wrangle the business that Travis knows more than anyone else. Let's turn to Nime. I mean, now as an investor, are you as confident as ever that we can see the company continue to grow, we can see the valuation continue to be supported when they lose such a divisive visionary such as Travis? I think that uh, Travis's involvement or lack of involvement going forward is absolutely a challenge and it's something the company's going to overcome. But there is plenty of precedent historically about non-founders stepping into the role of CEO and taking businesses forward. We look at Eric Schmidt at Google, albeit you know earlier in the life cycle of Google, but 
took over, took the reins and look at where Google is today. Um, not in the same facet, in the same uh, view, but you know when Steve Jobs passed away and took Tim Cook took the reins at Apple. I mean, he's a founder and CEO. You know, uh, passed away, and and Apple is up 200 percent since uh, since uh, Steve Jobs passing. So there is absolutely precedent uh, for non-founders taking you know taking a back seat and businesses continuing to appreciate value and continue to do great things. So uh, I, we're excited about who's going to step into those shoes. They're big ones for sure. Uh, but there is lots of talented people out there that are excited about uh, taking on this opportunity, taking on this challenge. It's an incredible business. Like Eric said, they did 20 billion of bookings last year. They continue to grow very quickly. And uh, we continue that gro We continue to believe that that growth will, will be sustained. They just need to have a, uh, 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 the right leadership at the helm to, um, to uh, continue that. Nemo, we're just looking at the amount of executives that need to be filled, the positions of CEO, COO, CFO, CMO, SVP of Engineering, General Counsel. First of all, who do you envisage being CEO? Have you got any names that are springing to mind? Who is your Eric Schmidt in, in my, your mind's eye? My, my vote's definitely for Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, there isn't anybody, uh, and I don't know if she's going to take the job, but there isn't anybody that is more capable and uh, embodies the culture and values that the company needs on a go forward basis. Uh, but uh, more generally speaking, they need someone with global experience, experience running a rapidly growing business as complex as, as Uber is, and someone that, again, embodies those, that's those values that um, they're looking to define on a go forward basis. Inclusion, empathy, these are the things that uh, the board and the investors are going to be looking for as they look to define a new CEO and fill out the rest of the operating bench. From your knowledge, has Cheryl Samo been approached by the uh, board or by investors? I, I don't know. I don't know. And can I quickly ask, therefore, how much you worry about the control Travis still continues to have from a voting share perspective, Nime? Going back to you know his resignation and him deciding to do that, I think that's the first step in a recognition that this is the right thing for the business. And from a governance and voting control standpoint, I think there's going to be uh, uh, steps taken going on a go-forward basis that help uh, create a little bit more balance and independence around the board. So we believe that those steps are 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 coming, and and that and that Travis will do the right thing from a governance standpoint. Let's not forget that that is also split between. Garrett and Ryan as well, and so there's um, there is some diversity there in in the in the voting control and, and ownership in the business, but that we should continue to see that uh, uh, a diversification on a go forward basis as well. Nemo Meta, partner at Lead Edge Capital. Thank you very much for joining us today. Bloomberg Technologies, Eric Newcomer, excellent reporting throughout late at night and into the early morning. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now, Amazon will start selling Nike shoes directly through a brand registry program. Now, according to people familiar with the matter, the system gives Nike greater control over counterfeit merchandise. It also aims to use machine learning to detect knockoffs listed in the future. Nike shares jumped on the news and continue to rise throughout the trading day. Now, coming up, Oracle and Adobe post record highs in US trading. Oracle getting an even further boost from its earnings after the close. We give you the latest on tech earnings. That's next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco, 10 p.m. London, 11 p.m. right here in Berlin. This is Bloomberg. Now, there could be a big deal in the software sector in the works. Bloomberg News has learned that BMC Software and enterprise software maker CA are said to be considering a combination that could take publicly listed CA private. Now, CA's shares surged on the report. If a deal goes ahead as a leveraged buyout, it would mark the biggest LBO of a tech company since the group led by Michael Dell and Silver Lake Management agreed to buy Dell. BMC has been owned by Bain and Golden Gate Capital since 2013, when they took the company private in a deal valued at about $6.9 billion. Now, meanwhile, Oracle's push into cloud computing is picking up momentum, and it sparked a fourth straight quarter of revenue gains for the software maker. Shares of Oracle extended its record high in after-hours trading after reporting stronger-than-expected fourth-quarter earnings results. 
Check that out, up 8.5% for more on this and other tech earnings that's caught our attention. Bloomberg's editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, is in San Francisco. And from New York, my guest co-host is Activate co-founder and CEO, Michael Wolf. Gentlemen, thanks for joining. First of all, Corey, let's just run through these numbers because we were actually expecting a slight slowdown in revenue. Yeah, the numbers from Oracle were super strong and a, and a bunch of different counts. Uh, uh, their cloud business, what they define as their cloud business, growing at fantastic rates. And we've kind of gotten accustomed to that uh, over time. The question is, how can they stem uh, or, or manage the shift from licensed software to the cloud business and what kind of struggles would those entail? There are lots of other things going on at Oracle. There's a vast oversimplification of their issues. But I think those are the real big issues. How do they move more to the cloud while keeping their revenues flowing, keeping their license business flowing? And, and the, there were sort of two big shockers in the results that came out after the close today. Uh, and one of them was just the fact that license sales seem to be better than services revenue. And services revenue is sort of the thing that comes in after they've sold a lot of licenses. So that's always great news. news. Whenever you, for, for going back 20 years, whenever you see Oracle sell more licenses and see licenses grow faster than sales, it just means that the tailwind is about to come uh, with the services revenues and go on for a very long time. It's very bullish for Oracle. But the other part of that is that you really saw license revenue declines in the single, we've been had single digits, we've had seen double digit declines in license revenue sales for many, many quarters from Oracle. This time I think it was 6% mm. or 4%, uh, a substantial improvement of that old core business. I don't know who's running out there buying software like it's 1999, but they certainly were <laughs> uh, with Oracle and Oracle shareholders loving that after the close today. <laughs> Michael, I mean, have you been telling all your companies that you consulted to go buying up software like it's 1999? But give us your sense on how the land lies for their fiscal 2018 versus some of the competitors out there. Right, I mean, I th there are a couple of things going on. One of them is it's not as if companies are just buying. It's that Oracle manages an incredible sales force, and, and they're great at finding ways to create demand and new applications within their customers that require their enterprise software. But there's another issue going on, which is that Oracle, people talk about Oracle's growth story, its growth engine being cloud services. But guess what? Cloud services are everybody else's growth engine, whether it's Microsoft or Workday or Salesforce or IBM. And so it's pretty amazing that they're able to continue to grow there despite the fact that they're facing a lot of headwinds of competition. And one of the reasons why they may be able to grow is because their licensed software business. They have this, this foothold into companies where companies need to use their, their ERP software and those same companies are buying the cloud services. Fascinating. So we're going to shift gears very quickly because Oracle's still, I mean, driving ahead in after hours trading. And we saw Adobe come out with numbers earlier. And Corey, they were again a good set of numbers. The shares didn't pop quite so much. I've got a Bloomberg chart if you dig into IG, hashtag BTV, and then type in 307. Many potentially questioning this little number. In the white, it's potentially quite how high its earnings per share have got. We're currently at 50. But then you look at the trailing 12 month earnings per share. So look Looking at what it might be going forward and estimates are that well the revenue just keeps growing and maybe price per earnings looks that little bit more tempting. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, look, I, I can connect the dots here with, with Oracle and Adobe. I mean, what Adobe did is really hard, right? The, they, they had to keep this business going but completely change it from licensed software to the cloud. The same thing that Oracle's trying to do right now. Uh, I, Carlo Canell, great money manager here in San Francisco, is famous for saying, it is possible to change a fan belt whilst the engine runs. That's what both companies have tried to do. But I want to take you inside of my terminal and show you something uh, about what uh, Oracle has done here. This is Adobe. This is Adobe's uh, the two lines here. The, the blue line is revenue, and the red line is deferred revenues. That is the money that they've collected for services not delivered. And what you see is a transition to the cloud. You can see uh, right about in this area right here, you start to see that, that all of a sudden this inflection point happened where the, the deferred revenues started getting bigger than the actual revenues. That's a much more predictable business model, but it's also the business model of the cloud. And we can take that exact same chart, if we turn it, turn it to Oracle, uh, suddenly what we're looking at here is um, a, a very different kind of uh, progression here, where you see the traditional software model of deferred revenues in the red grow, and then you see it jump with actual revenues later. But look how it's getting closer and closer to moving uh, uh, hand in glove. 
Oracle would much like to have its business show big deferred revenues like the cloud and actual revenues showing up a little while afterwards. That's the model they're after. Adobe's already there. Oracle's moving in that direction. The trends are blowing in the right direction. Gentlemen, great to be discussing these sorts of earnings with you both. Bloomberg editor at large, Corey Johnson. Great chart off with you. And Activate co-founder and CEO, Michael Wolf. He'll be sticking with us this hour. Now coming up, Queen Elizabeth's speech to lawmakers, how the UK will handle its withdrawal from the European Union. We'll dig into the impact on the tech business and entrepreneurs. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Queen Elizabeth II outlined Prime Minister Theresa May's agenda to lawmakers in the UK. The formal ceremony marked the opening of Parliament in London. Brexit obviously dominates May's programme for the next two years as the country tries to find the right balance as it separates from the European Union. Bloomberg's Anna Edwards has the details from London. Brexit dominated the Queen's speech in London on Wednesday as the government tried to set out its legislative agenda for the two years that lie ahead. On the Brexit front, we heard about policies on immigration and about trade. Both of those could prove contentious as those who want a hard Brexit versus those who want a soft Brexit battle for influence over government policy. Many domestic policies that could have been controversial had to be dropped after the Conservative Party failed to maintain its majority at the most recent election earlier on this month. Also absent from the address was any mention of a controversial state visit by President Donald Trump this parliament. Later, a spokesperson for the Theresa May government said that the only reason this was not included was that no date has yet been set. The Queen's speech also included reference to policies on electric cars, a commitment to review counter-terrorism strategy and to hold an inquiry into the Grenfell fire in a tower block in West London last week. The first real test for this government comes next week week when the Commons gets to vote on the contents of the Queen's speech. Anna Edwards, Bloomberg News, London. And from policies on electric vehicles to a measure that would allow space rockets to be launched from British soil, one of the biggest concerns for tech businesses in the UK is also maintaining and attracting the best tech talent for their workforce. Now, I sat down with London Deputy Mayor of Business, that's Rajesh Agrawal, and asked him, well, see, will ensure that London's diverse tech pool talent will continue. We've made it very, very clear uh, that the uh, European citizens already here, they are Londoners uh, to us. And they've contributed significantly to London's economy. Uh, and we are, I think it's absolutely the right thing to do uh, that, the, uh, that they are given permanent right to stay here. The London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, has so far been talking about an individual deal for London, particularly with respect to immigration. Is that something you're hopeful of? Well, I do hope there is a national solution. Uh, the government recognizes the importance uh, of talent. London has benefited significantly uh, from this amazing talent pool. And to be honest, when London does well, the whole country does well because we are, I like to think, the economic engine uh, of the UK because we produce almost a quarter of the country's GDP. So. So when London does well, the whole country does well. And I hope there is a national solution towards this. Uh, but if not, uh, then, uh, then we'll uh, look at some interesting ideas that have been tabled. What sort of interesting ideas? Uh, well, there are examples of regional visa schemes, which I know the City of London Corporation uh, and some of the other organizations have worked towards. Uh, but really, the important thing is that we remain open uh, for talent, uh, we remain open for business, for investment, for ideas, and, uh, uh, and there's a national solution to this. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, was in London just this week talking about how perhaps the government is now going to become more focused on business. How do you think the business climate is, in London in particular? How is optimism among the various sectors? Well, of course, businesses don't like uncertainty, and uh, uh, we've got that in abundance right now. Uh, but at the same time, they've shown a lot of confidence. If you look at uh, straight after the Brexit referendum, uh, you know, th there was a, there was a uh, assumption that there will be a mass exodus of businesses from uh, London. We haven't seen that. I'm very glad that businesses uh, are not taking any rash decisions. Uh, they are waiting and watching and sort of creating contingency plans, which is rightly so. Uh, but it will, um, 
you know, businesses overall uh, remain uh, confident about London's future whilst amongst all this uncertainty. What sectors do you feel are the most thriving and perhaps feeling the most concern and uncertainty? For example, the financial services, an area that we were particularly focused on and very strong on in London, is that managing to remain consistent despite the financial crisis and Brexit? Well, London is a very diverse economy. I mean, of course, we are the financial capital of the world and the banking capital of the world, uh, but we've also got a very thriving uh, tech sector. We've got a very thriving life sciences sector. Uh, so uh, London is a very, very diverse economy and you know, it is the economy of the future. So there's a huge amount of work doing, particularly if we talk about tech industry, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, some of the most innovative solutions are coming up. Just this, this week, the mayor uh, outlined his vision for London to be a leading smart city. And what smart city actually means is using technological solution to tackle uh, some of the sort of challenges of the growing urban population. And these are challenges not just faced by London, but from cities around the world. Um, and London is very well positioned uh, to be number one. It's already a leading city in the world in smart technologies. But I think we really uh, uh, can take this to the next level. That was London Deputy Mayor of Business, Rajesh Agrawal. Now coming up, more on the fallout of Travis Kalanick's resignation from Uber. A closer look on how he turned the startup into a $5 billion powerhouse. This is Bloomberg. How do you walk that line when you're in the middle of a crisis situation? It's really all about enabling people. Technology needs to serve everyone. But at the end of the day, it's all about emotional decision. I think there's huge innovation left in music. The hallmark of a truly great leader is that great is never great enough. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The FBI says the gunman, James Hodgkinson, acted alone when he shot and wounded Congressman Steve Scalise and four others and did not have any ties to terrorism. Scalise's condition has been upgraded to fair. For the next two years, Brexit will dominate UK Prime Minister Theresa May's agenda. Queen Elizabeth outlined May's legislative priorities in her annual speech to lawmakers. The government plans eight new laws to ease the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Scotland could be given a separate vote on Brexit legislation. Theresa May says her officials are in talks with counterparts over whether the Edinburgh Parliament will be legally required to give its so-called repeal bill consent, which paves the way for Brexit. It will overturn about 80,000 pieces of EU law. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 Wednesday evening here in Washington, 7.30 Thursday morning now in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Elisa. Well, let's start across the Tasman Sea in New Zealand for a change. And the New Zealand dollar up a little this morning. This is after the Reserve Bank held the cash rate as expected by all 15 economists surveyed at one and three quarter percent. That's even though the RBNZ said a lower New Zealand dollar would help rebalance growth. Uh, the governor saying monetary policy there will remain accommodative for a considerable period. On the markets, ASX futures pointing higher by about a third of one percent, uh, rebounding after, after Wednesday's sell down. Uh, Nikkei futures looking a little weaker. Might be worth keeping an eye on the troubled airbag maker Takata, both today and for the next few days. Uh, it's expected to file for bankruptcy possibly this week, and the Tokyo Stock Exchange is expanding the lower limit for Takata from today. A couple of other rate decisions out today as well from Taiwan and the Philippines, and Noble Group is in uh, talks with potential investors after extending its credit facility. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Tech technology next.
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in Family Chang. And let's return to our lead, Travis Kalanick, leaving behind his top post at Uber. Kalanick upended the transportation industry and grew the company's bookings to $20 billion last year. But he's also played a starring role in many of the company's biggest controversies, including this video showing an argument with a driver about pay published by Bloomberg. So what does today's news mean for leadership at Uber and beyond? And what legacy will Travis Kalanick leave behind at the company, as he, which he, of course, helped to build? We're now joined by Bloomberg Gadfly columnist Shira Overday and, of course, my co-host for the hour, Activate CEO Michael Wolf. Shira, let's kick off with you because quite fascinating. Travis, of course, was a visionary. He also was divisive. I mean, what are we therefore going to be seeing in terms of what this means for very few other entrepreneurs potentially having this sort of legacy? And we heard Bill Gurley, one of the key investors in Uber, saying, look, this is something you should be talking about. Look, I don't think we know what Uber is going to look like without Travis Kalanick. For better or for worse, this was a company made in his image. And I think Uber needs to figure out, I mean, first, who its leader is going to be, and then what does the company look like without this kind of very powerful CEO and co-founder leading the company on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're right. I mean, I think this is a wake-up call. Every time there's one of these scandals, uh, with Silicon Valley startups, it should be, and it is, a wake-up call for its peers in Silicon Valley that, look, there is investor pressure from the outside, no matter how much you insulate yourself with super voting shares and things like this. If you, um, if you turn off investors, if they think their investment is at stake, they will push you out. Michael, I think this is such a fascinating element to the whole story is that many people hold off going public because they're worried about activist investors. But it doesn't seem to matter whether you're public or private. Investors can still weigh in and can still turf out a very powerful CEO. Um, at, at this kind of evaluation, at $65 billion of a private valuation, the board still has a massive amount of control. And, and in a lot of ways, people look at what's happened here and they can look and they can see the huge amount of value that Travis has created. But at the same time, Silicon Valley is really the toughest labor market in the world. And being a company that can recruit the best technologists, I mean, the biggest companies in the Valley, those who have, who have the best technologists are the, are the win. And so the, making sure this is a place that can attract the best talent and really build technologists is more more critical. And so it's not surprising that the board looked at these problems and said it's going to get in the way of the company's growth. And the investors clearly saw the same thing. Shira, it's not just potentially companies and other CEOs of other, of other tech giants that need to be potentially aware of themselves, but also the culture that which b builds within a Silicon Valley powerhouse and the bro culture. Is it therefore well and truly under the spotlight and on the way out? I mean, I think it has been for several years now, right, when you had this movement to sort of look at the demographics of workforces in Silicon Valley. And most companies were pretty embarrassed by what they found, right, that the leadership ranks, the engineering talent, uh, the engineering workforce at these companies are heavily dominated by white men. And uh, once those numbers started coming out, that really put pressure on these companies. But it is very hard to change, right? These are sort of systemic issues, not unique to the technology industry, although interesting, you know, the tech industry thinks of itself as a meritocracy. And so that means when there are clearly these skewed workforces, um, it, it it kind of erases that image of Silicon Valley uh, as this kind of ultimate um, Valhalla where everything goes goes right. Michael, I want to pull on your expertise now, not just as CEO of Activate and talking to other tech companies, but as your expertise on the board. You were on the board of Yahoo, you were on the board of Slide, you're currently on the board of iAmplify. What does it mean when you take out such a visionary from the top, such a strong CEO, and try to replace with a new one, and not meant to mention just CEO, but CFO, but general counsel, the amount of but there's filling a lot they of have missing to do, management what do you here. advise? Uh, well, first of all, the question comes down to, is it the idea, is it where the company is today and, and versus the leadership of the company? And you could argue 
that a lot of what's happening today at Uber is a flywheel. The business will keep going on uh, regardless of its founder. And not a lot of people have made the, the analogy to Steve Jobs, who left at a certain point in, in, the, in the company's growth and, yes, came back later. But this is a case where things are going great for Uber. It continues to grow. And it continues to take to, to really reshape the way that people manage transportation. At the same time, however, it's missing a lot of management and CFO, COO is all the positions that you described and other ones that we probably don't even know about yet. So in this moment, they've got to require, they've got to go out and recruit a new CEO. They have to bring in all those other people and change the culture because they're not just competing for rides. They're also competing for the best talent and talent in the valley will go to the place that A, they like the best and B, they can make the most amount of money. And Shira, you've written about this. Talk to us about what the competitors should now be doing. Then perhaps not present in Europe, but Lyft is certainly a tough competitor when it comes to the US. And there are competitors in Germany, such as Get. And then also the regulators. I mean, knives are out, you've written. Yeah, I mean, the, to me, this is the risk to Uber right now is there's a leadership vacuum. There, the company is grappling with these kind of multiple crises all at once. And the issue is this is not a business where you can kind of let your guard down for a second because, as you mentioned, Uber has many competitors, Lyft in the U.S., uh, Ola in places like India, Grab in Southeast Asia, and on and on. Uh, those are markets that Uber needs to dominate if it wants to justify its valuation, and it's facing an embolden rivals. And yes, at the same time, you have all these enemies of Uber, um, disgruntled drivers, disgruntled regulators, disgruntled politicians, and now they can sort of see that Uber is weakened, and that gives them the power to sort of press their demands on the company as well. And again, that could hurt the company at a period when it's looking for a CEO, when it's grappling with all these other crises on top of crises. Michael, and lastly to you, you were at, on the board of Yahoo in its most tumultuous changeover. What does the new CEO of Uber have to do? What's their strengths that they need to bring to a table? I, I think that they need to change this company's culture. I think they need to retain its aggressiveness in the marketplace. It's opening up new cities and really dealing with municipalities. But at the same time, they've got to be able to enhance the user experience. They're, they're still, as, they're, as they face more competition, they're not just competing on price, but they're competing on an experience for how you use the app, how do you find rides, all the other services that are around that. So it's gonna be a tough challenge, re reshaping a culture, changing a technology company, dealing with the, the real world of municipalities and drivers fascinating discussion with Michael Wolf, CEO of Activate, our guest host for the hour. And Shira Overday, of course, columnist at Bloomberg Gadfly. Do check out her stories on Bloomberg.com. Now, an update out of Detroit for you, where Alibaba's two-day gateway conference wrapped up. The event drew in thousands of U.S. business owners aiming to learn how to succeed in China through Alibaba. Giving his keynote address Wednesday, Alibaba founder Jack Ma was optimistic about his promise of job growth. We also created more than, more than 33 million jobs. This is what we feel for China. This is what we feel most proud of. Our goal is that we're bigger, even crazier. Coming up, Toshiba is said to be in the final stage of negotiations with bidders for its memory chip unit. We're live in Tokyo next. And a reminder of our interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg to watch us live. And if you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message, play along with the charts we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers, of course, only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. A shakeup at Tesla. The head of its self-driving software unit, Chris Latner, is out less than six months after he joined the electric car company from Apple. The new head of Tesla's autopilot software and hardware will be Jim Keller. Keller came to Tesla last year from Advanced Micro Devices. Now, after months of speculation, Toshiba is inching closer to announcing the sale. 
sale will be a short-term gain, freeing up cash it needs. Now, of course, we're going to be digging into this much more now, looking ahead into what has happened really with Toshiba. Let's get out to Tokyo, where we have our current, of course, and now we're going to be going, moving on from Tokyo. We'll be coming back to Tokyo in just a few minutes. Let's first of all, though, go to Apple Music because overall we're going to be looking at how Apple Music has been looking to expand its presence. But now we're going to be able to be talking instead about cord cutting. We dig into the cosmic shift taking a place and how it has challenged the way that media approaches has television. Now we're going to be looking in part of the negotiations to revise Apple's overall relationship with music industry now. This is according to people familiar with the matter. The record label's deals with Apple expire at the end of June, though they are said to be likely extended if the parties can't agree on new terms by then. The negotiations would bring Apple closer to the rate Spotify pays labels. Now coming up we're going to be discussing of course yet further into the ongoing uber extravaganza we're going to be looking a little bit further of course at the fallout from travis kalnick and indeed how he's been working potentially to move off from the board of course this is something we're going to be extrapolating at the moment and we're going to be also looking into what the board activision activision really was here because we didn't see of course the board really focusing in. It was instead the investor base that pushed towards Travis's exit, we understand. The debate now is who will be taking over and indeed how many other CEOs there might be potentially out there. Many people looking at some of the names that could potentially be there. Now, we can look a little bit now at the months after speculation involving Toshiba now. It's inching closer to announcing the sale of its profitable memory chip business. Toshiba's sale will be a short-term gain, freeing up cash it needs to pay creditors and setting the company back on the right path after huge losses from its nuclear subsidiary, Westinghouse. For more, we're joined by Reed Stevenson, who covers technology for Bloomberg News in Tokyo. Reed, Wonderful to have you join us. Thank you very much indeed. First of all, let me look at really the consortium of buyers. At last, we get them. But it's a complex um, group of, of payers because the financing and the money on the table isn't all that clear. Exactly. Uh, essentially, we have a private equity component, uh, Bain Capital, and then two state uh, Japanese state-supported funds, um, the Innovation Network Corp of Japan, which is really aimed at uh, investing in you know new technologies and, and, and new areas, as well as the Development Bank of Japan, and SK Hynix, a competitor in the chip uh, memory chip space, is also joining, also in the form of debt, uh, just to make sure that uh, they don't uh, get caught up in any uh, antitrust or regulatory hurdles. Okay, so now we move forward potentially in terms of antitrust regulatory hurdles. I want to understand what other hurdles there could be because, of course, there was some issues with Western Digital not liking some of the people who are potentially going to be buying Toshiba. Are those sorts of issues all put to rest? Yeah, there's two main hurdles to think of at this point. One of them is, is by and large, mostly resolved. Um, and that is uh, not so much antitrust, but uh, essentially the Japanese government uh, trying to make sure that key technology doesn't uh, find its way overseas uh, into the hands of uh, you know Chinese or, or Korean manufacturers. Uh, with the participation of those two state-backed funds, uh, that's probably going to be uh, pretty much resolved. The other issue, as you mentioned, is Western Digital. Now, they are already a partner with Toshiba in that they have um, invested in equipment together, but it's a, it's a rather small part of the overall uh, memory chip business. Uh, but what Western Digital is um, concerned about is that um, the business might fall into the hands of a competitor. Uh, Broadcom is also uh, still, at this point, uh, a bidder for the business, although it's looking unlikely that they are going to win. Um, and, and one of Western Digital's um, objectives was to make sure that uh, the uh, the chip business didn't fall into a competitor's hands. Now, what uh, Western Digital has done very briefly is uh, filed an injunction to try and stop the sale, 
But at this point, our read is that Bain Capital and the consortium that it's created are probably pretty confident that it can overcome any legal challenges. And that's why they have emerged as the uh, leading or preferred bidder for the chip unit. Fascinating. Of course, this one will run and run. And indeed, how much the cash infusion is so desperately needed by Toshiba and how sad, though, it will be to say goodbye to its chip unit. Reese Stevenson in with Bloomberg News in Tokyo. Thank you very much for getting up so early. Now, coming up, cord cutting looks like it's here to stay. How it has challenged the way media approaches television. This is Bloomberg. Now, there is a new wave of TV streaming wars on the horizon. The media giants have certainly taken notice. Just this week, CNN announced plans to invest $40 million in its video startup. Great big story. Vice's Shane Smith became a billionaire with an influx of cash from TPG, a move that will help the company develop new streaming offerings. And 21st Century Fox participated in a $55 million funding round for the streaming startup Fubo TV. Back with us from New York to discuss is my guest co-host, Activate CEO Michael Wolf. Michael knows the media business well. Of course, he was a former born member of Yahoo and former president of MTV Networks. Michael, dig into some of these trends that we're seeing because the shift for cord cutting is well and truly on. Digital TV is here to stay, but who are going to be the winners? Well, you haven't even begun to, to, to mention the names of all the other people who are now focused on digital video. Facebook is going to produce uh, shows. You've got BuzzFeed, which is also producing shows. Um, Fusion Media Group, that's part of Univision, it's producing online shows. Um, NBC with Left Field. So we have a large number of companies who you would have said weren't on the web before. And they're now creating television and shows that will be not just on their own platforms, but on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter. And so wh why are they doing this? Because the name of the game in the internet is engagement. And video leads to engagement. I'm fascinated in particular by the $450 million fundraising by Vice because where which revenue model wins out here is it subscription based we look at that from fubo tv but then we look at vice with the advertising and they're managing to woo in advertisers despite actually well the viewing figures particularly on their cable channel not looking all that hot uh, part of what explains vice's success from an advertising perspective is that they are reaching an audience that's very hard to get and that's millennials and they've got an edge, and, a, and, and they're almost a subversive edge to the, to the company, which gets those millennials to come back. But they're not just selling advertising. They're also selling marketing. They're finding ways in which they can in integrate their marketers' products into their actual programming and, and help them create advertising. And that's, that's one of the things that's differentiating them. Now, I expect that everybody else in video is going to be doing the same thing and that Vice is going to face a lot of competition. Okay, everything's, everyone's going to be doing the same thing. What about some of the key losers here then? Who should we be if we're a shareholders getting our money out of? Because it would spring to mind that it would be the cable providers, particularly cable TV, but some of them actually seem to be getting their skin in the game in some of these investment rounds. Yeah, m my firm continues to see growth in cable TV. Uh, cord cutting will continue, but it's going to, to, to be at a slower rate. And part of the reason why cord cutting is even happening is, is that there are a lot of millennials who our research shows are, are sharing passwords and, and using their parents' passwords for their TV anywhere. Uh, I think that the losers are gonna be those cable networks which aren't able to, to maintain ratings. And there, is, there, are, there are some of them who just haven't been able to maintain ratings in a world where they have competition against digital video. The others will be websites and other digital media yeah. that don't have video because they need video to grow. Need to stay ahead of the game, need to be in the video game. Precisely. My guest co-host for, co for the hour, Activates co-founder and CEO, Michael Wolf. Wonderful to have you joining us live from New York.
And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Now, on Thursday, I'll be leading up Bloomberg's coverage of the NOAA conference right here in Berlin, speaking with a great lineup of guests, including Axel Springer CEO Matthias Dupner and John Collison, Stripe president and co-founder. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV.